Hey, 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 good morning, good afternoon, and of course, good evening. Really depends on when you're listening and watching this podcast. So, hey, you know, I, I read this post the other day about global warming, and someone made a comment saying, well, we're getting some snow up in our hills, so what's this about global warming? That's just fake news. Well, you know, I don't know about you guys, but here's what I think. When I hear global warming, I'm thinking of the whole thing as a climate change. Sure, temperatures are rising. We, You know, if it's a one or two degrees, we can't tell. If it's in the water, we don't know because we're on land. But definitely, we've seen a trend where it is getting hotter across the planet. Now, it may be seasonal, but it's hotter. And then, of course, we see all this more tornadoes, typhoons, tidal waves, uh, torrential downpour of rain and all that. So there is something, something happening out there. No scientists. I'm just a guy that watches the news, watches the weather report. What do you think? Put it in the comments. Let me know. Is there such a thing as global warming, climate change? I want to hear your thoughts on that. And if there's an expert out there, Maybe you'll come on the show and we'll talk about that. Anyhow, so today on this podcast, it is a mother-son uh, podcast. So both of them are on, Robert and Nancy. And this is about Nancy had cancer. She had other difficulties with her health. And her son, Robert, stepped up and took care of her. But there are other siblings who also shared in part of helping mom out. But this is more about Robert and his mom and less about the person who has cancer or had cancer, which would be Nancy, and more about the caregiving person, which is Robert. You know, oftentimes we miss out on talking about the caregiver because oftentimes, you know, the caregiver is possibly getting ill, um, you know, losing sleep, not eating correct. Because they're taking care of someone else and helping. And we tend to forget about that person. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the caregiver, about Robert, and about the situation that he went through, the changes that he had to go in his life. Also with Nancy and what the significance was about cancer and how it changed her life. So if you're ready, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, of course, in 2016 is when you heard those that dreaded phrase or sentence, you know, you have ovarian cancer. So I kind of want to find out really who you were before cancer, because I know mm. part of your thing is that cancer kind of opened your eyes to certain things and almost like allowed you to start living, so to speak. Um, mm. So I, I, I wanted to find out from you, who were you before, before cancer? And mm. what made... What, because I'm going to say, because you said in a way it was a gift. So what gift did it give you? What did it make you realize that you needed to do in your life? And for, you know, Robert, the finance guy. Uh, um, yeah. More or less, uh, your, again, your life prior to and then becoming a caregiver. And then I, what I'd like you to be able to do is, is tie in this mental health. How, how did it affect you, Robert? Um, caring for your mom, I mean, because you had to make a lot of sacrifices. You know, it's I helped my dad. Uh, unfortunately, he passed, so I was helping him during the hospice to, to the end of his life, and that changed a whole lot of things for me. And it gave me a different perspective and outlook on um, my mortality. But we don't have to get into that part. But if you want to, yeah. well, I'd uh, love to hear back from you. Can, can I jump in with this, with what I'd love Robert to share? Because this is what yeah. I think is his real gift is we are trying to inspire caregivers on how they can make caregiving fun and take care of themselves at the same time and how yeah. they can, and how they can like add to their army and all those things so that they're not so stressed out. Would that yeah. be okay if we discuss that? Oh, absolutely. Because I wanted to kind of lead into that with, I'm thinking possibly the yeah. music, you know, your piano playing not only yeah. helped your mom and everybody else around, but probably helped yeah. you because music to me, Absolutely. I play music. Um, see, back there. You got guitars, yeah. We, uh, we remember those from the, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
it, it, music is soothing, right, Robert? I mean, it, it's a great release. Yeah, it, it's like definitely my happy place. Like even yeah. nowadays when I'm like, I, I don't consider myself an introvert, but I certainly like uh, uh, there are moments where you feel it. So like at, at parties or something like that, if there's like a piano nearby, every once in a while I'll just like, okay, I've had enough of this party. I'm just going to sit at the piano and like play. And that's my happy place. And this is where I like recharge my energy and and like... I don't care if other people come around or whatever. This is just for me and I'm doing this for myself. Uh, yeah. I, I do that all the time. Yeah, you know what I would love it? Can I just jump in? I'd love yeah. you guys to have the discussion about music and stuff. I said to Robert, I want him to talk more today. because No, because I think that caregivers really need to hear more. You know, it's like, here's my story and stuff. But I think the two of you with music, that's why I was like, oh, my God, I'm so happy you're with Chuck. I love that. But that's just yeah. me. Well, you know, you're you're we're kind of sort of starting right now. But uh, Nancy, you're absolutely yeah. right. As far as, you know, people look at um, and I, I don't mean to be insensitive to anybody that's listening or to you. But oftentimes, when, if you have a caregiver and you have the the uh, person who's ill, a lot of us are putting so much focus on the person who is ill, not realizing that the caregiver has emotions, has a heart, and also could become ill because they're not taking care of themselves, uh, which is a huge, huge um, yeah, well, almost uh, half, of, almost half of all like full time caregivers end up with uh, depression. I think twenty uh, percent of all caregivers end up with depression. So it's like a real, it's a real problem, and. I think it's it's like incredibly important, like you're saying, for uh, you know, there's this phrase like uh, put on your own oxygen mask before helping before helping others. Like if if you're yeah. not taking care of yourself as a caregiver, you're going from there being one person who needs help to there being two people who need help, right? Yeah, you're like in, in, they're, you're creating more of a problem, and you just it's just so important to take care of yourself first and foremost. It is. In fact, I have a short story to share with the two of you because I just recently found out with a coworker. Uh, you know, I work remotely. This is just kind of uh, my love and passion, and takes up a whole lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so a a coworker's mom had cancer, uh, and she went back to help her mom back in May uh, in Taiwan, and so her her mom passed away in July. So she flew back to the States and went back to work. And everybody is just like, you don't look good. You know, you look sick. And she said, well, I lost 16 pounds. You know, I was helping my mom. Right. From May to July. Well, here we are, September 1. She died last week. Oh, my God. She had oh cancer. My. She didn't even know. She spent so much time helping her mom. She <sighs> didn't know. She was just putting it up. I mean, all that time, but she's just saying, I, right. you know, I was tired helping my mom. And it wasn't until a, a, another coworker, yep, another coworker said, you should go to the doctors because you look really sick. So, but um, anyhow, but yes, um, Robert and all caregivers are very, very uh, important in this whole grand scheme of things. And we all, we, we need to do our part to help the caregiver exactly. as well. Yeah. So, uh, Nancy, so like we were saying, in, in who were you before 2016? In the summer of 2016, you got that, you know, awful, awful message from the doctors that you have ovarian cancer. And, and I know you went through other cancer too, and you just, there's so much that you went through, but who were you before 2016? And then what was your mindset? What, when you heard those words. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, before June of 2016, I had the life I think most people only dream of. I was a very successful relationship and wellness coach. I had a wonderful husband that loved me. I had three beautiful children and many friends and family who we biked, hiked. I was always outdoors gardening and traveling and I was just on the go and, and literally loving life all the time, mostly outdoors. And the moment that I heard, you have ovarian cancer, my world stopped 
my earth was shattered. And the reason, you know, it's one thing to hear, you know, something where it's, it's something that's not going to take forever or, you know, you can get through this. But I was thrown into the hospital for a week while they gathered a team of surgeons for eight days, for seven days, eight surgeons, where they had a surgery with me for over 10 hours. And after that, I had weekly chemo sessions for six months, twice weekly infusions. I had many infections. I was back in the hospital more times than I can count. And it was a hard thing to survive. And then after that, I, after my remission, which was incredible that I got there, I was vacationing in Rome with a friend and I suffered a grand mal seizure was whisked away to a public hospital where they diagnosed me with a huge brain tumor, tumor. And my daughter, wonderful daughter, helped me get back to Miami to have brain surgery where they diagnosed me with metastatic brain cancer and informed me that I might never speak again. I might, be, I might have paralysis on my right side and my life expectancy was five months. Hmm. It was such a harrowing journey, and it's now five years that I'm alive, and I am thriving. And I'd like to say that because of my son and my girl, my daughters and my girlfriends and my whole family and an army that I had at my side, they really did teach me the lessons of how to endure this horrible cancer and make it an optimistic and fun and empowering journey. And I owe it to them, which is why, you know, so much of my life now that I have and had during the journey, and that's why I believe that I was able to endure. I don't know why I'm alive. I, I, I call it luck and everything else from, uh, from my amazing doctors to prayer to, to, all the laughing I had, all the humor, but I owe it to my caregivers. And that's why my son was so kind to say, yeah, let's write this book and let's talk, talk to other people about what caregiving really means. Yeah, it's caregiving is really important. Um, I want to ask you too, because, you know, hearing those tragic words that you have cancer and the metastatic brain cancer uh, tumor, um, and hearing that you had a, I'm going to say, a lavish, beautiful life lifestyle prior to this, um, did you do, do you with a with foresight? Do you feel like you took things for granted, and then after these things happened, you kind of went, you know what? I I, I need to start living and not taking things for granted. I I ask this because. You, you are having a beautiful, lo lovely life now. I mean, awesome life. It just really seems that I see the smile on both of your faces, on Robert, your son's, on his face, yours. You're happy to share this story. But it sounds like that you had this great life prior to. I don't know how much better can it be now. And was it kind of taken for granted for before? And now you, you can value things a little bit more. I wouldn't go as far as to say that she took things for granted. Okay. I, well, I'm, how I'm, about you, Nancy? Previous <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, she, she certainly is so much more grounded and down to earth and, and appreciative of things nowadays than she ever was. It's, it's wonderful. Um, do, do you want to add any, anything from, from your side of things? Yes. I, I think the I think everyone would say that I'm much more appreciative every moment of every day. And I it's it's wonderful to use the word I'm more grounded. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm much more one of the things that happens to me, I can only be uh only speak for yourself. Yeah. I can only speak for myself and I can only be the expert of, of my life. But for me, what it did for me was open up my faults, my, my mistakes, my, the way I was thinking that uh, really 
made it harder for me to endure. And it wasn't where people might go to therapy and say, you know, one at a time. I had to tackle it all at once. My life mm -hmm. was literally torn apart. And so, yeah, I look at myself and others differently. I look at every moment differently. And because of that, I do see for me that my cancer in so many ways was a blessing. And I do see a world that's much more rosier and I'm much more wanting to survive and thrive every day and make a difference. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think your priorities have changed. I think that's the yeah. big thing. I think, um, okay. you know, what would have been a like setback that she just needed to absolutely fix and would like fixate on and, and make sure that it was, you know, everything was perfect, right? Nowadays, she can sort of roll with the punches a little bit more, you know? Like, life throws curveballs at all of us, and, you know, she used to insist that they were fast, like, on making them fastballs, and nowadays she just swings for the curveballs instead. <laughs> you know, yeah. that makes perfect sense, uh, or a great analogy on that, too, because I, I would imagine, um, and I, I don't want to say that this is how it was, or how you are, or were, uh, but... Uh, you may end up being a little bit more kind to people. You may be a little bit more forgiving. It's okay if Robert, you know, comes over and leaves his socks on the floor, you know, at your place. That's still not okay. That's still, <laughs> oh, that's still not okay. <laughs> I have my boundaries. <laughs> but I, and Robert, you kind of answered what I wanted to ask is if you have seen the, any changes in your mom, you know, since she has gone through all of this, um, but, and you did answer a little bit, but can you elaborate a little bit more on these positive changes that uh, uh, you've seen in your mom? And how has it changed you from fearing that you may lose your mom to seeing her thrive, thriving for these five years and for another 10 or 20 or 30 years? I don't know if you want to live to be 100 plus. Some say they don't. but so. She's in phenomenal shape. Uh, you know, uh, so maybe, you know, it could be, could be 40, um, you know, cancer does sort of leave its mark. So who knows how long she's actually got, but, uh, we go rock climbing and skiing and play tennis and stuff like that together. So she's in, she's in incredible shape right now. Um, as far as what I saw change my mom, um, certainly she's more optimistic now than she ever was. Uh, yeah. I, I think she's, you know, she's seen the worst that life has to offer, at least, you know, from one side of things here. There are, you know, plenty of other hardships people go through that are equally difficult on wildly different axes. Um, but uh, sh she has this ability to see the positive in things now that she never used to. Um, and I think she's really sort of given that to all of us as well. Um, you know, when, when she was going through cancer, uh, she was this, like, emaciated shell of herself. Like, th this, this woman... Uh, has always been a strong and powerful woman. Uh, sometimes, to my chagrin, when I was growing up, uh, she taught aerobics classes at five in the morning, and she made seven-year-old me go to aerobics classes <laughs> at five in the morning. And it turns out seven-year-olds don't like being up at that time. Um, so that, that you know, that that's a strong, powerful woman that she was. And then, and then suddenly, she's lost 25, 30 pounds. Has no muscle mass. Her like her thighs were, you know, thinner than my wrists right now. Like it just like this tiny shell of a, a you know, formerly strong woman. And, you know, every moment that she was able to like laugh or smile or something like that while going through that is just, just reminds you that, you know, even when you're going through the worst times, there's still, there's still moments where you can be happy, still moments where you can find fun. And so I, I think that optimism is really carried through to the rest of us as well. That's great. I'd like to um, say I do laugh at life a lot more. Yeah. You know, I found that he's really good at humor and some of my friends are really good at humor and we suffered some some ridiculous moments when either nurses or without meaning to would say horrific things and what we would end up doing is laugh out loud hysterically. Yeah. So I would say that that's something that is carried through for me is is Truly looking at the ridiculous of yeah. life, you know, ridiculousness of life. It's yeah. like there's this uh, there's this great phrase I love that uh, comedy is just tragedy plus time. <laughs> and I, she like 
He was like, hey, why do we even need this time thing? Like, <laughs> like just, comedy's just ready. Let's go. Full that, circle. <laughs> that is something I would suggest to every human yeah. being right now is like, just start just laughing laugh about it. at everything just in life. Laugh. It makes you really a better person for yeah. everybody and especially for your, your soul, you yeah. know? <laughs> I mean, you're right. I mean, we we have heard, you know, in the past, or at least for the older people, you know, laughter is a great cure. It, it cures a lot. And just the same as, you know, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. It's just <laughs> laughter. And I think that lowers your stress because stress um, stress can lead to a lot of, a, a lot of illnesses, uh, whether mental or physical. So the one thing I'm glad what you said, Robert, is that your mom went through this terrible thing, but she's not the only person. And then there are other tragedies that happen to other people out there all the time. Uh, because I, I, it'd be great to have people know that this is a story of two people, of many people. This is the main story on cancer, uh, you know, metastatic brain cancer. But there are so much similarities and it doesn't matter what your illness is. You have a caregiver and you have a person who's ill. You have people who love each other and that love helps you, you know, go through things. So I, I would like to ask you, Nancy, is did you ever lose hope that you would get better and that there would be a cure for you? And I use cure lightly because, you know, like you said, Things go away, could come back, but I just want to say cure. And so going back to what I said about hope, did you ever lose hope, sight of you being better? Oh, yes. <laughs> I lost hope. I, 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 I don't even know what to say next. Yes, it was. I, I was ready to give up multiple times. And at one point, I really wanted to give up hope. And so, Robert, did you did you see that in her that she was? Like, oh yes, oh she very clearly gave up hope. Um, multiple, I mean, uh, one time in particular. Uh, but the, the, there were a lot of times when you could sort of see the fight leave her, and and mm. it was really important for us caregivers. And I, I don't want to take full credit for the, I am, I am not her only caregiver. She had an army behind her. I was one of many, thank God, because uh, I, I couldn't have done it on my own and I don't think any of us could have done it on our own. It was a tough battle, let's just um, say it that way. But the, you know, there, there were times where we had to uh, talk her off a metaphorical or literal cliff. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but she listened, you know, that's, that's important. I, I, I think it was important for us to like we, we had to be vulnerable in those moments, you know, we had to yeah. tell her uh, like how her decision to give up made us feel, why it was important to us that she stick around, um, you know, um, and, and it's tough to be vulnerable. Uh, I think people are like, especially bad at it, they, they see it as a weakness and I, I, don't, I don't think it is. I think it's actually, it takes strength to be vulnerable. It's, yeah. it's really challenging. It, it does. Um, I want to ask you on this one too, Robert, because I know certain things, if, if people are feeling bad or feeling lonely or depressed, you know, happy memories, happy sounds bring us back and you are, you have to be an accomplished pianist. So <laughs> would you, uh, would you I, say, I have, <laughs> yes. uh, I have accomplished life-saving with my piano skills, if nothing else. Uh, so, yeah. So I want to ask you, it's, you know, do you feel like that music, what you did, playing those sounds, whether it be familiar or not for your mom, do you think the music helped her bring her back into this um, positive place and give her some hope and strength? I mean, your mom's yeah. shaking her head like, yes, it did. Yeah. Uh, did you see that happen, Robert, when you're sitting there playing Chopin or oh, whatever yeah. it is you might have been playing? Uh so I, I play a lot of songs by ear. Um, I love playing like Disney songs or like classic rock or, uh, you know, things from musicals, stuff like that. Um, stuff that like I can sing along to or other people can sing along to. Oh. And uh, the most notable time uh, during her first stint at the hospital when she was first diagnosed, 
Uh, she showed up to the hospital like 25 pounds underweight. She's not a large woman, uh, so 25 pounds is a lot. Um, but she showed up to the hospital 25 pounds underweight, um, and her doctors needed a week to gather a team of specialists to operate. And she's just stuck in this, you know, hospital room. It's, it's not it's not a welcoming place. You know, beeps, whirs, and clicks of machines. This whole, um, you know, just white, very clean environment that doesn't feel very welcoming at all. Uh, so the first thing we did was uh, we you know, realized that we needed to change something. And so we did, uh, we, we grabbed some of her favorite possessions from, from home, a couple of plants to sort of like spruce up the area, um, her like pillow and blankets and stuff like that to make her feel comfortable in bed. And this stuffed animal that she's had since she was six, a little, <laughs> little Tigger stuffed animal that has seen better days, but, uh, you know, still has like all, all of the, uh, all the sentimental attachment to it that uh, that you know nothing else could possibly have, and it still wasn't quite enough. So my um, my dad and I went to a local music store and grabbed an electric piano that's actually sitting next to us right now, uh, oh. and like confidently walked her through the halls of the hospital. Like people like looking at us, like what are those guys? Doing? <laughs> um, uh, and and you know plunked it down in her room and and just started playing. And I, I think I played for four or five hours a day for a week straight. Uh, wow. But yeah. it, it, it was clear, like, the moment I started playing, you could see, like, the, the light start to come back to her eyes. And, um, and I'd like to join I'm in. I'm not sure she would have made it otherwise. No, but the doctors were singing. The nurses were singing. <laughs> and he was his favorite in, in the hall because all the other patients could hear him. So <laughs> it was... It wasn't just me that he was helping. He was helping everyone on that hall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Robert, did it give you any sense of um, comfort and release of any negative energy or anything like that that you had when yeah, you started playing? Absolutely. Did it help you? Um, I, I think, you know, uh, music, re really all forms of creative expression are, are a wonderful way to um, not just get your emotions out, but also, like, restore some of your humanity and and for me playing the piano and singing are, are my two big ones and so getting to do both of them uh you know is is incredibly helpful uh it, it was it was very cathartic for me it also gave me like a sense of purpose which is so important you know you, it's it's easy to feel helpless when you're seeing you know a loved one just sort of like sitting in this bed and and like i'm not a doctor i don't know what i could possibly do um, but you, you can help, you can, you can help with their emotional state and that's just as important, right? Like no one's, no one's winning this fight if they don't have a reason to win this fight. You need to remind them why they want to live. And so, you know, uh, for, for me, it's playing piano, but for you, it might be telling jokes or reading your favorite book or, you know, sketching a picture of them. It doesn't really matter as long as you're sharing a passion of yours with them. Uh, that'll remind them of their humanity and, and remind them why, why it is that they're fighting this fight. So with that being said, you, the two of you co-authored book, a book together that will be coming out uh, this fall, fall of 2023. And can you give us the title and your web page? I'm, I'm looking at it, but I, I, I'd rather hear it from you, and I think everybody Absolutely. else would as well. Yeah. Um, uh, so... Yeah, uh, our, so our book is your web. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your website. I'll just do it real quick, and then you can tell us about sure. the book uh, and the book title and everything. It kind of goes along with it. Is uh, becoming the better you, and it's not Y O U um, on the website on the URLs. Becoming the better you with the letter U. Dot yeah. com. Yeah, becoming the uh, best you. Oh, best. But, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> Becoming the best for you. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I got this poor eyesight. I'm looking up there going, oh, yeah, what is this? <laughs> some comparative adjective of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> that is called an <laughs> edit right <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, Better, best, yeah, whatever, you uh, know. <laughs> there is a step along the way. Uh, but hopefully... Uh, you can becoming yeah becoming the best you the letter U is the website and the book is becoming the best you while watching your life go down the drain the lessons cancer taught me yeah and again although and even though this was uh, your cancer story this is going to resonate I think with people who have had 
all illnesses across the board. And again, not just the patient or the person that's going through the illness, but the caregiver person as well. Um, whether it be several people or one person, uh, mm -hmm. because with the two of you wrote this and um, I'm just looking at the cover of the book and you know, it's, you look at the book cover and you look at you and it's a drastic difference in change. Just your position that you're sitting there by the river, the bridge, um, you know, shaved head, just thinking or contemplating, um, whether it be where do I go from now or why did it happen to me or, or what's next? But it's, it's such a drastic difference. Just, uh, looking at you there. Um, yeah, and, and are these some of the, the chapters, the change what you can, ask for help, and things like that? Titles of some of the chapters? Yes, I mean, the chapters okay. are fun chapters, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know. How did you get a piano in here? <laughs> are you there, Doc? It's me, Cancer. Yeah. You know, but we, they are, the steps along the way are, in fact, you know, asking for help and getting your affairs in order and pushing yourself and taking life one step at a time and packing a toolbox of strategies. And lastly, accepting that grief is a price we pay for love. And they're all in there. We just have fun chapter titles, but they're all so important. And I do agree that, you know, the lessons I learned are lessons for actually everyone because mm -hmm. these lessons, these are my mantras. And that's what, has helped me every day when more challenges come up, you know, life is not for the faint of heart. That's what I always say. So yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. John. This might be a little bit of a, uh, a change away from what we're talking about, but you kind of mentioned being prepared, being ready, uh, having your affairs in order. So I would imagine so many people don't do that until the last minute, which can add some additional stress. So would you, or are the two of you, would you say, you know what? Don't wait till you get sick or till the end. Get things in order now, whether it be, you know, DNRs, um, wills, things like that. Would you, would you tend to agree and... Um, it, yeah. It, don't look at it as Absolutely. a negative thing, right? Meaning that just because you're preparing for this doesn't mean that that person's going to end. You, this is just part of living, right? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, DNRs and wills and all those sorts of things are so important. Um, also, funeral plans, what you want to be done with your body. Um, you know, a, a lot of these things, they seem like end of life plans, but it's, a lot of it's really just deciding what's important to you now, right? Like, like a will isn't like, what do I want to happen after I'm gone? It's like, who's important to me in life? What, what causes are important to me in life? You know, do, do I want to donate some of my money to a charity that I particularly like? This is something that I've asked everyone to do, whether yeah. you're 35 or 75, is number one, have that discussion with your loved ones. How do I want to be remembered? How do I want to be buried? How do I want the service to look like? Yeah. Who do I want, to, if there is a charity, to start setting that up? And I do believe, we've always been saying this, Robert and I, is that the more that your loved ones know how you want your life to be remembered and how you want your will to go, you are saving everyone from difficult, challenging discussions. And sometimes it's more divisive. You don't want when you die to tear your family apart. You want it to be a celebration of life. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. Yeah. But it's also, it's, it's important that it, it is deciding what's important to you now, right? And, and that's, that's something that is useful to know whether or not I die tomorrow. It's important to know what's important to me right now. Right. And, and, you know. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think those discussions are very important for people to have. No, that's so correct. I agree with yeah. you on this. It does yeah. help you. Like, I got my affairs in order. Right. Um, and what happened to me is, yeah, I got to really think about what I wanted. And that's, again, why is my life better than it was? Yeah. It's because I had not had that discussion. Right. What do I want to be remembered for? Yeah. doesn't have to be like, what have I done in the past? It can also be like, 
what can I do in the future to be remembered for, you know? Like mm-hmm. that, that, that can give you a purpose. Which set, is, set your life, a, you know, set, set a goal for yourself. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah. Well, that's why we wrote the book is I said, I want to be able to give back after all this. Yeah. So. Well, and I, just listening to the two of you, uh, it's, I definitely think you accomplished what you have set out to do in your book. Uh, it's, I, I'm just, I'm just sitting here hoping, going, boy, I hope the personalities are in the pages of this book because <laughs> if it is, this is the number one bestseller on New York Times list. You know, it's. I can't wait. Because there's that. It'll reach more people. Yeah. Imagine how many people will be have their their whatever journey, their obstacles in life, a lot more optimistic and fun. People don't like using the word fun, but you can make a cancer journey or any horrible journey more fun. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, we did some very. I, cool I, well, I truly believe your book um, is going to help a lot of people. It's just a matter of now the people putting it into their hands and really reading uh, your book. Once it comes out here, like I said, fall 23, um, it's there's no reason not to, right? It, it, it's yeah. you want to you learn from others' experiences. And this is going to give you this head start or advanced look at, well, this is what they went through. Maybe I should or could follow something similar to that. Or I saw, now I understand what the pain points are. Now my son or my daughter or whoever's a caregiver understands a little bit about the emotions that they may be going through. And it's okay to have these emotions. You know? So uh, for me, to the two of you, I say thank you on that. Um, gosh, it's, I, I'm, I'm going to call this a session. This session has been wonderful. Now I, 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 I'm, I'm prepared. <laughs> you are um, so wonderful, Chuck. Mm, I love what you're doing. It's incredible. Uh, thanks. Uh, the one last thing for me that I want to say about this, and since we've talked about wills and DNRs and having your affairs in order, just because you do that, like you said, whether you're 25, 35, 40, whenever you put it together, it's not set in stone. It's just got things in order. You can always change that. It's better to do now and to be prepared. So, Excellent. Exactly, uh, yeah. Uh, any, any last words from the two of you as far as your, your book or how you're feeling? How are, how are the two of you today? How are you doing? Wonderful. I, I'm, I'm wonderful. I think she's wonderful. I'm wonderful. I think it's the best I've ever been. And I would say the same with Robert. Yeah, absolutely best. Best I the rest have ever been. It's yeah. great. Yeah. And I it, want to say one to... thing about the book. Yeah. yeah. The book is a really short read. It is. Yeah. I mean, it. you can, you sit down, you could read it in two hours. And we did this on purpose because the people that we really want everyone to reach, you don't have the time. You might not have the energy. So... Trust that if you just open it up and read a few pages, sit down. I think that no matter what, people can glean either perspective of how grateful they are that they have their health, which is a beautiful thing to be, and just getting one idea of how they can make either being a caregiver or being a patient or a survivor a little bit more optimistic and look at life a little differently. You know what? It... it really sounds like this is a book that you don't read and put away. You know, there's a lot of books you read, and when you're done, you put it on the shelf, you don't read it again. But this one sounds like it's something that you could pick up. Like I said, read a couple pages, read a chapter, go read it again in five days if you want, put it away, read the entire book on a weekend, come back six months later, pick it up and read it again. And it's a feel-good book, right? Uh, If I'm saying it's wrong... But it just sounds like it's one of those books that'll be a feel good. It puts you in that place of understanding. So, uh, Robert, are you going to continue playing the piano or are you going to start? Are you going out for the next vocalist for Journey? (laughs) No, no, no. They got that covered. I'm I'm not entering any YouTube competitions anytime soon. (laughs) Well, from from what I hear, there's there's trouble in that band. So there may be a position open. (laughs) 
right. Well, I'm just a small town boy, so. Uh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, well, um, again, this has been, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation and I've enjoyed just honestly seeing the two of your faces and just listening to you. It, it, this is great. I'm, I feel, I feel good now. You two made me feel good. Thank you very much for your day, for your time today. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. We're very grateful All for right. being on Hopefully your show. Hopefully we can shoehorn those bits <laughs> together <laughs> <laughs> yep so should i hit the stop button now yes uh, yeah i think we're good um, incredible. Um, 